Hey guys, welcome back to Tennis 360, the podcast where we talk about all things tennis. My name's Anthony Hirsch. And I'm Eliza Westgate. And welcome back to the podcast. We've had just about one week of Indian Wells played. Um, Eliza, have you been at the at the place where it's being held? How's uh, how's the atmosphere been and all of that? Oh, it's been great. You know, it's one of my favorite tournaments on the calendar year. I think there's always good turnout. I think this year there's been in a way like almost more fun turnout than than ever friday saturday grounds passes were sold out people are coming out in droves and you know main reason behind that is that there's such a good opportunity to see top ranked players on outside courts i was able to get in and see some doubles with Sina and sinego playing hachanov and rublev for literally like a 60 dollar ticket um so it really is an awesome experience for fans to get close and personal without having to spend bucket loads like you might do at a Grand Slam. And of course, it's just a beautiful venue, amazing facilities, the weather, the scenery. So um, it's a special one on the calendar. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Have you been, had a chance to like, I, I saw you had a chance to speak to some players as well. So yeah. like Paul Garuna and Tejung as well. How's that been? Oh, it's been a lot of fun. So I, I attended an event earlier in the week called Taste of Tennis, where I got the chance to interview some players, ask them about their, their food choices, who they would ask them to cook them a meal and what they would ask for, which was quite fun. Um, and then later on in the week, I've been lucky to have press access. So I've been hanging out on the players' lawn, watching players do their, their thing, their warm up. Some of them are spending way too much time playing soccer, football. Um, in their warm up time and others seem to be a little bit more focused. So it's always fun to kind of see how players approach their pre-match rituals and also getting to watch them on their practice courts and kind of what they're doing in those uh, world. So I'll be back on Thursday through the rest of the tournament. So if you guys want to follow along and check in on how everything's developing, you can follow me on Instagram. I'll be posting all my stories. Yeah. And you'll, I'm sure talk about it. We can next week on the podcast as well. Yes, we can do a full debrief. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think that's good though about seeing about the players and diving into their lives. I think that's something that a lot of tennis fans actually want to see. I know it's something that I'm personally interested in with the players. Yeah, it's fun to just talk to them, get to know them outside of like just the tennis brain, because obviously yeah. they're they're human beings, not robots. And I think um we don't dive enough into like how players' different personalities might also translate to how they actually play the game. So I think it's important sure. that as media we get to know them beyond just tennis players and, and try to get an understanding of who they like to spend time with, what they like to do, what they yeah. like to eat, you know. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a one on one sport. So I think that's exactly. the way I can do it, yeah. Um, all right, well, Djokovic with a huge upset, uh, or sorry, Djokovic faces a huge upset in Luke Nardi, uh, 20 year old, uh, who's outside top 100 in the world. Uh, I don't think anybody had this on their cards. No, <laughs> that is nuts. Um, yeah, Luke Nardi, uh, I, I mean, he played exceptionally well, uh, in the match. He had 34 winners, 19 unforced errors. I mean, listen, not that many people beat Novak the first time that they get to play them, get to play him. And uh, to do it at such a big stage in a big event is super, uh, it's just, it's monumental, I think. And I think it's notable to say that Novak's been getting close with a lot of guys recently, whether that's losses like Demon at United Cup, or whether mm-hmm. that's Sinner uh, beating him three of the last four times that they played, or whether mm-hmm. that's just, you know, in Paris and ATP Finals losing so many sets to different guys, whether it's Greek Sport or Rublev or even Lahetchka at United Cup. He's been he's been getting closer, a uh, pop run at the Australian Open. These guys have get, been getting closer than usual with Novak, who I think is usually so dominant. So um, I think right out of the gate, uh, do you, do you think it's the start of a decline for Novak? I, mm-hmm. I do think the age thing might be something to take into account with, with Djokovic at the moment, how, how it's all going. Yeah. I mean, I always hesitate to doubt him just, just based on his records and who he is, but I think he would be the first to admit that the last, since, I don't know, since the US Open, that performances have been a little bit hit and miss, more inconsistencies. Even at Wimbledon, um, you know, losing losing there in a couple of tight matches, it, it, as you say, it feels like players are getting closer, even if he is coming through with the win, he's going the distance more often. He's having to, um, you know, take the time to figure players out and sort of rely on 
uh, you know, tie breaks or tight moments to get himself through. And I, you know, I think his loss to Sinner at the Australian Open, yes, was not one of his best performances. Like, I don't, I don't think we saw his best tennis that day. But I also think we saw Sinner's best tennis and put into context just how good Sinner is at the moment. And so I hesitate to look at that loss and be like, oh, that that's like the start of your demise. But then, yeah, some of these like random results like this one yesterday, or as you mentioned, some of these matches getting tighter and tighter, you sort of think, is it an age and energy thing? Is it a mental preparation? Like, you know, you're kind of... Um, your focus, your commitment to turning up week in, week out. I do feel like when you're not competing in between tournaments, you lose a sharpness and an edge. And um, as you get older, you're more likely to turn up and, and have a bad day every once in a while. And I think that's probably what we're going to start seeing is that Djokovic is going to have more bad days because because of his age, he's he's inconsistent in his appearances in the tournaments and calendar years. So, um he probably has a lot to to think about as to why you know these last two tournaments in the in the biggest moments he's not been able to bring his to best tennis he's not looked totally focused and one begins to wonder you know as you say is it is it the beginning of the end for him i i wish i had a crystal ball and knew the answer but certainly um you know wouldn't be afraid of pointing in that direction yeah i think I think it would be uh, – you'd be hard-pressed to say that he's just going to automatically fall off a cliff now as he's at right. world number one. But yes. I think, yeah, I think you're looking at a point in his career where you might be looking at decline, especially a decline from where he was last season. I think you're right about the age. Um, you know, when you're, uh, when you're turning 37 years old, you start worrying, okay, well, uh, I might need to close this match out right now or I don't know if I have that much left in the tank uh, to right. give. And also just, uh, you know, Novak's won a lot. You have questions about motivations. He's been doing this a long time. There are other guys with fresher, uh, who are fresher right now. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's, uh, it, it's well to point out. I think actually Novak, in my opinion, I think he actually played well against Nardi. Nardi. The problem is Novak wasn't Novak. He was letting yeah. Nardi play too much. And he just wasn't yeah. – uh, and it just – that was that was the issue um, – also, Novak was hitting a lot of drop shots, and that was, like, never working once against Nardi. Mm -hmm. Nardi kept uh, uh, catching Novak out with that, hitting a lot of great passes. Nardi was really impressive from the back of the court kind of counterpunching. I think Nardi mm -hmm. really likes a kind of uh, slower court to kind of help out his game. Uh, he was getting a lot of great width on his shots, a lot of great down the line. So Nardi was playing really well, but I would, I would be hard-pressed to say that even though I think Nardi played his best tennis – I also don't know if I would say that, you know, it's to the level of Alcaraz in the fifth set of Wimbledon or something like uh, this. Yeah. I think exactly. that I and I think that Djokovic should be winning these kind of matches. And that makes it more of a question mark on Novak rather than impressive for Nardi. That being said, very impressive stuff from Nardi. But definitely it, both can be true. Big question marks for Novak moving forward, I think. Yeah, and the other little kind of nugget I'll throw in is as an observation <clears throat> and a thought is I, I feel like since he has the record for 24 Grand Slams and he's sort of, yeah, chasing after all these titles, I feel like there's been almost a change in his personality, his demeanor, his desire to leave a legacy of being well liked and loved by fans and being, yeah, the number one guy and sort of being able to to relish that and revel in it. And I don't mean that from like a negative and mean way, but I think he is trying to maintain a certain um, relationship with the fans and if anything, try to clean up the rough edges of his legacy in tennis so that he can feel more like a Roger, more like a Rafa in that kind of post-retirement like love that he has always been chasing and hasn't had in the same way that those two have. And just watching him this week, Djokovic gives so much energy and time to the media, to the press, to the fans he's you know out there on the lawn and i'm not saying it's performative but like he was stopping for 30 40 minutes signing autographs he he was you know 
playing t uh, a, a game of footy on the lawn with lots of other little players. And you, it kind of felt like he has been putting on a little bit of a kind of show, like a, I, I don't know, you know, he's like filming a documentary. He's got stuff going on and I just feel like he is trying really hard to portray a certain image and relationship with the fans at the moment. Now, of course, if you're a Djokovic fan, it's amazing that he spends that much time with his people trying to, you know, give back. And I don't think it comes from a selfish or a negative place, but I think it comes from this sort of underlying desire that we've always seen from Djokovic to be as well liked and as well loved as, as Nadal and Federer. And when you are 37 years old and you're number one in the world, and you're still trying to be on top of your game, those are really hard things to stay on top of and do really well and do to that extreme. And, you know, even just like with Rafa pulling out this week, like we didn't really see him dedicating that amount of time to fans, you know, spending that amount of his energy, um, even though he pulled out entertaining and kind of doing the media and the posturing piece. And I, I do wonder if that, you know, begins to impact your mentals in terms of the pressure, in terms of, yeah, like how much mental capacity you really have spare to nail down and, and focus on early rounds in these tournaments or focus on bigger matches. I just feel like it takes up a lot of mental space. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting point. Um, I don't know. I, th I think um, that in the in the big term, I think that it's probably um, a positive thing, at least to want to, uh, look, uh, to go to the fans and want to give them the best possible time. Um, and I'm not sure. I think that Rafa and Roger at their best, especially um, I remember Roger a lot was giving a lot of time to fans. So I, yeah. I would probably disagree that I don't think that that's big of a – that to me, from my perspective, I don't think it's that big of a factor for Novak. Um, and I like to see him reaching out to fans more because he does have such a large fan base um, who travels around the world, which I don't think is often given enough credit for, actually. So um, no, I think I think that's good from Novak to be to do that. Um, I I would also agree that Novak is a different personality from Rafa and Roger, and he should only try to be who he is, and it's worked out for him for many years. But I think the more time he can give to fans, I I tend to think Novak is a good-hearted person, uh, genuinely, and I think that you know I, I think it's good for him to do that. And what happens, I think, of his form even happens with his form, but I think he's making a lot of people stay with that. So. I would I, I would argue that that's I don't think it's that big of a factor, but also um, I do kind of understand where what you're getting at. But to me, I don't think it's that big of a factor, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, whatever's happening, Novak's losing and that's not a good thing to see. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, Luke and Artie, I mean, five of his last nine losses, by the way, to Italians, which is uh, don't know what's going on. But the Italian mafia kind of coming for Novak. It's not good. A lot of young <laughs> Italians coming for him. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, also just last thing on the night, what do you think of the hindrance, hindrance, uh, oh, I think, there? I think Djokovic was wrong. I don't think that that was hindrance. I mean, I, let, let, let's watch highlight reels of Gal Monfils pretending like he was walking backwards and the sure. point was over and he comes back alive. Same with Medvedev. I mean, Djokovic is well experienced enough to know that that is not a hindrance. Sorry. Yeah, and also he could have finished the point before he's. I mean, yeah. he was in like winning position. He just stopped. He literally yeah. just stopped. I couldn't it believe bizarre. what I was watching. It was strange. Yeah. Um, no. But see, that's where I'm like thinking like you have a. Uh, there's a lapse in concentration. Like the mental energy like is not the same. Yeah, I. I that agree. intensity. I, I don't know I, where that's coming from, but it, it certainly is different than what we're used to seeing in terms of the mental commitment from his end. It doesn't, the intensity isn't the same. Sure. I just think, I think maybe it just comes from a different place. And maybe it's the fact that he's not really chasing, like he's not, Roger and Rafa aren't really playing at the moment. He doesn't have that same motivation. I think that could be a big part of it, actually, which is why when people say, take Roger or Rafa out of the equation, Novak would have had 40 majors. I'm like, even everybody know everybody who understands the game understands that that's probably not true because they yeah. had to push Novak to get there. So whatever's happening, something's off with Novak. We'll see how he regroups because we haven't really seen a point like this with Novak, Rafa, and Roger so out of sorts um, while Roger's yeah. retired, but the point stands. Um, but yeah, okay. And then uh, on to another, uh, another thing that's going on, which is uh, the another young guy doing well, which is Yuri Lahechka getting the win over uh, Tits Boss today, Rublev, a couple of days ago. And uh, he beat Rublev 6-4, 6-4. 
uh, played a fantastic match um, against Rublev. Lots and lots of winners. Um, and uh, he, he averaged on the forehand uh, a better miles per hour than even Alcaraz or Sinner did. Mm. And um, yeah. it was it was very, uh, very impressive stuff. From Lahechka, Rublev kept getting a lot of balls short on defense, allowing Lahechka to attack. But it really was like the roles reversed. Um, and then, yeah, against Steph today, once again, I just confidently looking like the guy who's in the top 10 of the world. And I, I just think uh, Lahechka's – I've been kind of gauging Lahechka. There's not been enough of a pool of matches to really see his game. I think there's just been too many unforced errors and inconsistency from him. But this week, it's just been fantastic. Usually averages uh, – uh, uh, shout-out Gil Gross with a stat – 71 miles per hour on the uh, back end. This week, it was 79 miles per hour. Um, so that is yeah. – and by the way, that is crazy for a backhand speed. And yeah. um, so – yeah, I mean, nearly 80 miles per hour on the back end and very, very impressive stuff for Lahechka. He, and uh, by the way, the whole top half of the men's draw is wide open now that Djokovic is out. Uh, yeah. the, the top guy who's left, uh, who you really, I think, will pay attention to is Medvedev. But I don't even think he likes these conditions so much. They neutralize <laughs> the serve. They bounce up high. Uh, you you want to attack in these kind of conditions. It, no, nothing about these conditions suit Medvedev at all. Mm. He can't generate the right pace. He can't, uh, and it's just it's just not working for Medvedev at all um, to play this kind of attacking game. Where a Taylor Fritz, for example, he likes having the time. He likes having the time um, to kind of set up the forehand shot and attack um, as it bounces up high. Fritz likes it, uh, but Medvedev struggles. Fritz is all also in this section. He's playing against Runa. Medvedev's got Grigor, um, and there's a lot of interesting things going on this half. Did you see Monfils bageling Kirkoch? That one I thought was crazy. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, so quickly on the hatch guy, I think he hits a huge ball. I actually saw him practicing with Thomas Burditch. I don't know if that's a new addition to his kind of hitting team, but a couple, couple um, we, of years. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and I feel like he's had a good good season so far. I mean, he didn't do badly in Australia and down under. Um, and I think he's he's just a very solid um kind of build and player so i think hitting big from the baseline is is you know his strength and the conditions at indian wells are certainly going to suit that um in terms of that half of the draw i mean as you say it's it's wide open now with the Djokovic loss and i agree that you know medvedev will continue to complain about the conditions here i mean we i watched his match last night with quarter there were several breaks of serve um he he doesn't look totally comfortable yet he finds a way to get through some of these matches i mean he made the final here last year played an awful final against alcaraz but you know still made the final and i think knowing him and just knowing his ability to be able to kind of figure out matches and um kind of get through tough moments i i would back him to 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 beat dimitrov tomorrow um but you know dimitrov is also having a great season and these conditions for him, I don't know if they're necessarily favorable for Dimitrov either, but I think he likes them a little bit better in terms of his slice backhand in particular. The ball stays very low on this surface and can skid very well because it's so sandy and grainy. Um, so I think, you know, he'll, he'll have a good chance. I, I think I watched Gil's video on like their kind of head to head going back and forth and not quite being able to pick between the yeah. two in different conditions. So I, I agree with him. I think this is tough to call. I'm not really sure. Um, and then in that section, I think Taylor Fritz, I mean, he won here, was it two years ago? He likes getting the ball a little bit higher up because he's so tall and his he's fine with having a slightly higher uh, kind of striking zone or hitting point than, um, than some of his opponents and i think this surface you know with a top spin ball it's it's going to jump up on you his serve kicks well on the surface he's obviously from california he knows these conditions really well i think he plays both um night and day matches well and i think he'll feel pretty comfortable and, and back himself here it'll be interesting to see you know which of those kind of three names really looks like a solid choice for the final it's it's still hard to call but um, he'll certainly have his eyes wide open and be very excited to see that Djokovic is not in his path to get to the final because that is his, I mean, Taylor Fritz is one kind of a uh, uh, hurdle that he is going to, has struggled to get over. And I think um, that matchup is just a tough one for him. So um, yeah, he'll be feeling pretty confident as a result of this. 
Yeah. Um, well, for the Grigor Daniil, um, I I think it's danger time for Medvedev, to be honest. He needs to serve way better than he did yesterday. Like you said, yeah. there are like 16 breaks to serve, which is crazy. And also, <laughs> yes, like like when do you, when do you see that? And, yeah. um, and also, he's just – there's so many points where he just let Korda hang on in the match and he needs yeah. to play much more because Dimitro's full of confidence. He's confident on the surface. He's confident at this tournament. He actually didn't do very well at Indian Wells for many years, but then a uh, strange time when it was played in October, he reached the semifinals. And then after that, he reached the quarterfinals. He's doing been doing pretty well under these conditions. And yeah. uh, Medvedev has the final in this bank, but I just don't know if this surface favors him. That's going to be a really interesting match. Um, I'd also mention mm -hmm. Holger who yeah. I don't really understand why he struggles so much on outdoor hard conditions. <laughs> um, it's a bit strange to me, but, uh, you know, he, uh, well, Raonic, he got a withdrawal against Raonic, then he beat Musetti, who's pretty out of form. Honestly, Musetti should have taken the second side. It was a tiebreaker. Yeah, I agree. But, um, but, you know, Runa's in here. Fritz is just so good at Indian Wells. Um, everything that you said, and I just feel like a lot of things that favor Runa in, in these conditions – I think favor Fritz even more. And I think that yeah. uh, Fritz is going to be able to get a good one here. Um, yeah, I, I think Rina will be a little bit upset that he's had a little bit of lack of match time too. I mean, you obviously had a buy in the first round, then Raonic yeah. pulled out, which we'll save as a discussion for another day on Raonic because I'm tired of these retirements from him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he'll be a little frustrated that he didn't have quite the match time. He didn't look super sharp against um, Musetti. I don't think he's had a killer start to this year either. I think he's waiting to run into some good form himself. And I don't think um, his matchup against Taylor Fritz right now would be a favorable opportunity uh, for him. If he did get a win, of course, that would be the start of some momentum. But I don't, I don't think he is playing quite the right ball and has quite the right rhythm right now to really upset uh, Taylor Fritz under these conditions. Yeah, I also think Fritz has been performing better recently. Um, he got yeah. to, he won Delray Beach a couple weeks right. ago, and um, I don't know, even a lot at Australian Open. I think, I think his performance against Djokovic went under the radar. I think he I didn't get enough credit for it especially because yeah. with that stat that he saved his first 15 break points, but he played great all around back end. Yeah. He was surviving against Djokovic and that's impressive enough. Just survive those rallies <laughs> against Novak, even if he yeah. couldn't attack as well. And off defense was really impressive as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think Taylor's a, a big person watch in the uh, top half or who could reach the, who could reach the final. Um, Who's Monfils got to play next? Casper Ruud. Okay, interesting. Because because so Monfils beat Harkatch. I think Harkatch was not well. He had some sort of stomach issue going on. Um, the bagel was totally bizarre. But what a treat that match was against Cam Norrie. Those two tie breaks. I mean, the the point he won to get through that second set tie break was classic Monfils. And he's another guy that was he thirty six, thirty seven. 37, turning 38 in September. I mean, he's up there in age, and my goodness, is he an entertainer. He's just so fabulous to watch. And um, you feel like oh, tennis fans, more than anything, would just love for this man to win one more like big title and, and get yeah. an opportunity like this. I, I don't think um, – I don't <sighs> – I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on Casper Ruud's form right now? Because I feel like these conditions are, are kind of favoring him. His forehand's looking pretty good. Uh, he's had a good couple runs. He's made two finals in a row in the last two tournaments. He lost those, but um, he's on a good run of form. Do you favor him to, to make a, a good run here? Uh, my only issue is that I'm so high on Monfils at the moment. I, uh, <laughs> I, I did pick Casper beforehand. I actually picked Monfils yeah. getting to the fourth round. Um, yeah. But I, uh, Monfils has really surprised me with this level. Herkoc was off his game, but Monfils was hitting so many errors, oh, so, so many winners, I yeah. should say, staying on top of the baseline. And I agree, Monfils at his best is just so fun to watch. He'll do things that you just don't see from anybody else. Mm -hmm. I do think that bagel from Herkoc was special. I think it was partly Herkoc, but I think it was partly Monfils as well, yeah. who goes all also bageled Monfils in the past. Um, yeah. Cam Nori was a fantastic match. I agree. I think that's the best uh, match of the tournament on the men's side so far that mm -hmm. I've watched. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how do I like Casper uh, in these conditions? I think Feast is a good matchup for him, especially in these uh, conditions. I think 
um, that faces a uh, face at the moment. I'm really high on him in the future, but he he's too impatient. I think Rude can like easily outclass him at the moment. And me, Rude to me is mentally so strong when it counts that to me, I was fairly, fairly confident he was going to get through that. Right now, to me, Rude is very good on hard courts at the moment. He's already 14 and three on the season in hard courts. Last year, he was 14 and 14 whole season. Um, so uh, two months in, we're at 14 and three. And uh, my thing is, is that Root is very good on hard courts. I don't think he's amazing on hard courts at the moment. So yeah. I think once he gets up against a really, really, really good opponent, I think it's going to be tough for him. But look, he made two back-to-back hard court finals. He probably should have won both of those finals. But he uh, still, uh, I do like Casper in these conditions. I agree with you. Um, I uh, And the draw has opened up big time. I think that Rude Monfils match is going to be blockbuster. Um, I yeah. think those are two talented guys. Um my feet certainly the flashier of the two, but uh, they're both in good form. And uh, I'm looking at Tommy Paul on the very, very top, tippity top of the draw. Because uh, yeah. this is a guy that people underestimate a lot. He's a very mm-hmm. good athlete. He likes moving forward. He likes switching things up, taking risks. Uh, he likes the big Masters tournaments. He's done well in big Masters tournaments before. Canada semifinal last year. He's got Luka Nardi, who just beat Djokovic. We'll see if Nardi can follow it up. But Nardi, before the Djokovic match, had only beaten one top 50 opponent in his entire career. Um, so I don't know if he can do two in a row, especially against Tommy Paul, who's playing so well, and beat Hugo Bear confidently when Humbert is in the form he is in as well. So uh, we'll see what all happens. Yeah. But... Um, but yeah, to, for me, Tommy Paul and Monfils are genuine dark horses. And you said, can Monfils win another big event? Monfils hasn't won a big event in his career, which is the saddest thing. He's reached finals. Yeah. He's never gotten mm-hmm. that master. So I would love to see him get his first. I uh, He's about the age that Federer was when he won Miami uh, a few years ago. And I don't know if that means a lot, but it means it's possible. And uh, we'll see what happens. So <laughs> Fingers crossed. I think Fingers crossed. every tennis fan in the world would be absolutely overjoyed if he would be able to to win this tournament i think it's a long shot but miracles yeah. can happen right <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, yeah i love watching gail honestly before we um, move on to wta if you have to pick a winner for the atp side ooh, that's a good question. you know we're at that point in the tournament where you, you gotta pick one Who you yeah picking? Man, that's well. I'm I'm gonna go with Yannick Sinner. Actually, I think the top half yeah. is more interesting because Yannick is just in such good form at the moment. Yeah. Um, he sat 17 and 0. Djokovic is out. I mean, yeah, Djokovic was gonna be tough anyway if Djokovic made it to the final. But uh, Sinner's confident, and uh, I'm going Yannick, who I think is gonna get through that top half. Um, on a best guess, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Fritz. But let me know who do you think. Uh, both, both, both things. Uh, who do you think is getting through the top half? Who, who's going to win? I think Sinna will also win the title. Um, will he have to face Alcaraz in the semis? Yes. Yeah. So that'll be a Dan tough Price matchup. Match, yeah. I, it's obviously a barometer, but I just, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd edge Sinna at the moment in terms of form overall for the year, and I just think he's going about his matches in such a smart and efficient way. I just think. I think he's elite, the elite performer right now, so I'd pick him to win, and I think it could well be a Sinner-Fritz final. Ooh, Sinner versus Fritz. I'll tell you what, that was an underrated match last year in the quarterfinals. Yeah. Uh, Sinner, yeah, that could be good. That could be my pretty yeah. good. That would be great. But I am stoked from the... for uh, Sinner-Shelton tonight. I don't, I don't think Shelton will have yeah. a chance, but um, he, he did beat him <laughs> earlier last year towards the yeah. end of uh, October and snaps in his winning streak. So you never know. Um, Shelton has a big serving day, but uh, should be a, should be an entertaining match. But I'm still picking Senna to win it. Yeah. Well, Sen- uh, Shelton will also pick Shelton to win, which I think is important for that. Yes. Uh, for that match. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, uh, all right. Well, let's move on to the WTA side uh, then. Um, okay, so first I want to start with uh, Sabalinka taking on uh, Peyton Stearns. Uh, oh that was one goodness. of that was one of the best matches I think of the whole season. Crazy stuff. <sighs> Sabalinka yeah. says four match points, difficult match points as well. Yeah. And um, Stearns played phenomenal as well. The level was so high, and yeah. um, you know both just absolutely going at it. Uh, what What do you think of the match, and what do you think will this will do for Sabalinka's confidence going forward? 
um, in this tournament. Yeah, such a fun match. I had the privilege to be there for that one. Amazing atmosphere. I mean, Peyton brings that college ball energy to her tennis, and it's so yeah. inviting for fans uh, to participate with her, especially in an American crowd. And I mean, she has proved over the last year that she certainly has big weapons to compete on the women's tour. She's ultra athletic. Um, I really like her forehand. It's sort of got like a buggy whip to it. I mean, she's she's really good at hitting an inside out cross court um, forehand on a short angle that's just so dangerous. And I mean, I think she'll be frustrated that, you know, she couldn't get the match done. But as you say, I mean, she, she didn't play bad points per se on the match points. She played a little tight, but also Savalenka just kind of had this like look on her face. I was like, yeah, all right. Like, <laughs> four match points like if I lose I lose type of approach yeah. and I think that's it. again like the evolution of Sabalenka has proved that she's not as intimidated by these situations as she has been in the past um doesn't doesn't seem to really be afraid of, of losing and just wants to play her best tennis and I also want to say that that match I think was such a good representation of women's tennis at a high level where you had you know, two female athletes who, you know, were both high energy, both come ons, you know, uh, aggressive in their nature, but were also great sportsmen, you know, uh, applauding each other on, on, you know, good points, their embrace after the match, Peyton's energy when she walked off the court, she was so proud of herself. I just thought it was such a really, you know, nice display of a competitive, you know, um, aggressive match that wasn't, you know, nasty or like, like had an had an undertone or a current to it that was like mean rivalry. It was just a fantastic tennis match. And I think they both appreciated that they brought some of that best tennis. I do think Sabalenka double faulted way too much in that match. I think she would admit that. I think she had too many errors off of her forehand side as well. And I think, um, yeah, she, she put herself in a hole at some moments that, um, you know, probably could have avoided being in the situation that she was got herself into facing match points. But I do think coming through matches like that set you up with great confidence. Of course, coming off the back of an AO title, then then took some time off for personal reasons and didn't have a good run uh, in the Middle East. Um, and so this was important for her to find some form. Then in her next match against Radakanu. I was actually messaging with her coach. I don't think she played her best tennis there either. He was like, she won ugly. And I was like, a win's a win. You know, what, what are you yeah. going to say? Like, again, I think her and also Coco this week have shown that in this sport, you're not going to play lights out 10 out of 10 tennis every single match. But what makes you a top five player, what makes you a Grand Slam champion is your ability to win ugly, to come through these matches, even when you're playing some really crappy tennis. And I think that both of these two women have showed that they have an ability to do that. And I think that's really important for stability in the women's game. And to, to yeah, to have these like consistent names that are at the top of the draw, even though <laughs> we'll talk about it, but the other half of the draw has sort of like fallen away and we're in another kind of uh, AO type of situation again, where you're like, mm, what the heck, you know, uh, are we doing? Yeah. But um, I think these, you know, three, four names are solidifying themselves for a reason and yeah. um, some awesome uh, battling out there to get through some tough matches. Yeah. Well, I like what you said. I think you saw the response on social media as well. Everybody was like, that was such a fun match to watch the ball strike yeah. from both. Um, yeah. And uh, I, th I think the quality was high. It surely wasn't where Sabalenka wanted it to be, uh, but it was mostly, I think, her digging herself into a hole and not winning the points that mattered the most right. was part of it as <laughs> yeah. well. Um but yeah, uh, anyway, at the end, it was, uh, um, Sabalenka got through it, but it was literally like a one point differential, which just always makes it so cra crazy. Meanwhile, Shriantek is on cruise control. She lost just seven games to, uh, two dangers from her Australian open draw, which was Collins and Noskova. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what a revenge. Yeah. Right. And, uh, just, she's just so good against Noskova. She was down four, two, 30, 40. I thought we were going to see a repeat, uh, in that match where Noskova is going to go up a double break. Shiontek doesn't yeah. even lose another game in that match. Yeah. Um, and he just turns it around. She starts winning some great backhand to back and exchanges. Her backhand is so good. Um, yeah. and I just starts playing more aggressively 
And it's so amazing to me to watch a player with as big and vast of a skill set as Shriantek because mm-hmm. she's just able to do so many different things. I think that's part of why she likes Indian Wells so much is, um, you know, it's kind of a slower hard court. It, uh, it allows her, you know, to kind of use the time that she gets on clay courts and kind of work defense to offense, but also allows her to like play offensively as well, which came in handy here against Noskova where she really took hold of the match. And I don't know, just such impressive just athleticism and skill set and she turned the match she she th- she's always thinking on her feet sometimes she even carries a book around with her thinking of different strategy and yeah. i just like that kind of also i think a great thing for w- women's tennis to have kind of that yeah. kind of a player at the top of the game yeah 100 percent. i mean i think um she's been on fantastic form since the AO. her runs in the middle east were super impressive got a title or two um under her belt and i do think a slow hardcore is Iga Sviantek's happy place and she, you know i think she'll be extremely tough to beat this week and to to yeah i think those two matches against collins and noskova were a proof of her ability to adjust tactics come back and not be afraid to play the same opponent again but i also think that it highlights the difference between Iga Sriantek on a fast hard court versus a slow hard court. AO plays a lot faster. Someone like a Collins and a Nascova, the penetration on their shots, which is deep and heavy and fast, is just, <clears throat> it penetrates more than it does on a slow hard court. And I think that um, it's totally into Sriantek's favor. And, you know, she's also a great ambassador of the women's game, again, in her ability to fight problem solve come back to challenging opponents and matches and figure out new tactics and ways to win and i think that she will certainly fancy herself to um you know really solidify that kind of number one ranking and you know begin that chase again with sabalenka and sort of reestablish it like yeah i am i am the number one i am the person to be on this tour even though sabalenka um you know has been playing some some great tennis this year as well so i think the shame in in the conversation around the women's game at the moment is rebecca's inconsistencies um you know she's really been struggling with some kind of illness issue since the french open last year she said she was <clears throat> sick again during um off season I don't know whether it's GI issues that are continuous and it's just like an ongoing problem that she has or if this is something new, um, but it, it feels like her, yeah, it's, it's like not injury, it's sickness. So it's it's a little bit strange and she'll obviously be very disappointed not to be able to defend the title. And I think that it does raise a bit of a question mark as to like, yeah, like how involved is she going to be in this conversation around big tournaments and around slams because it has been just so inconsistent from her side really since the AO of last year where she made the final and then it feels like it's sort of dropped off in level since then. We've seen moments, mm, peaks of, of Rabakana, you know, has two titles this year already, you know, did did well, but then has these blips and illnesses and moments where she has to pull out. And um, yeah, it's unfortunate really because I think we were really headed towards that big four conversation um with all of them having at least one grand slam title so um yeah wishing her a speedy recovery and hopefully she'll be a part of the conversation again soon yeah i hope so um i mean i've said it before on this podcast i think she has one of the highest peaks on the tour and um i think that it's always sad with the player who gets uh just deals with so much injury and illness i mean i think that um Rabachna, uh, is a player who is still young and has time, uh, you know, from about Wimbledon to Roland Garros last year was uh, just a great kind of run of form. And I agree. I mean, I think part of it is probably a, a lack of form at points, but you know, she had a great little part of the season there, but also her getting just constant illness is uh, just sad. And I hope that it doesn't mark or define her career rather than the, her one Wimbledon title or something like this. Um, right. that, would, that would be highly unfortunate. So I'm hoping a good recovery for her. Also, by the way, Von Drusva also pulling out, which is, uh, she, that's yeah. not the first time that's happened either. Yeah. So I actually saw uh, her in tears on the practice court. So something really. injury is bothering her. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. So wishing both of them recoveries and, uh, we just don't want to see that for players that good and that talented. Um, the two yeah. last Wimbledon champions as well, by the way, I just don't, yeah. don't like seeing that. So, yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully they pick it up. 
Um, Zhang has uh, been kind of struggling since the Australian yeah. Open final. Uh, mm -hmm. She lost to Yuan, compatriot. Um, yeah. it's, it's a match, honestly, she could have won. Uh, watching parts of it, Yuan didn't even play, I think, that special. So many, I mean, she played well, Yuan, but there's so many deuce games in that match, and Zhang just hitting so many unforced errors on the, on the break points. And, um, you know, Yuan was taking the match when it counted. At 3-1 uh, the second set, as Zhang was trying to break back, she made two poor backhands in the net, then a forehand return just missed completely long. Just way too many errors from Zhang. And she needs to figure out a kind of middle ground of where she's not just going for it, going for it every single shot and uh, figuring out the way to, like, peak on the points that matter. So we'll see what Zhang can do. I still think she's a great athlete. She'll figure it out. Um, I, I don't I didn't think she was automatically gonna get just be a top five player after the Australian Open final, but hopefully she can pick it up because even before the Australian Open final, she was doing some really impressive stuff and winning titles. So hopefully she gets back yeah. to that kind of form. Um, yeah, I think it's the progression for her. You know, she's she's gone from kind of rookie of the year, breaking into the top twenty and consistently being there, and then breaking into the top 10 at the start of this year and having, yeah, some really good performance. So obviously making the AO final is big. I do think um, sometimes, you know, that conversation around a young player's uh, psyche and ego and sort of dealing with uh, a Grand Slam final loss can be a difficult conversation. I mean, we saw that a little bit with Leila Fernandez, obviously much more extreme in sort of the drop-off in form. And she she kind of came out of nowhere in that AO, uh, US Open run. So I don't think it's a comparison, but... I do think it's something that, you know, um, can can add some mental fatigue for a player. And as you say, I think she's still finding the limits of her game and and where she needs to play within a kind of safe zone so that she can be consistently successful. Yeah, and and the serve probably needs a big improvement. I, I think the serve is about 50% at where the potential for the serve can be at, to be mm -hmm. honest. I think her serve has a lot of potential. Um, but uh, ho I mean, hopefully we see a Yannick like progression right now. It's not where it, it needs to be. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what kind of happens with that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, are there any other things that kind of stand out to you on the woman's side before we move on to the power rankings? See. Look, I mean, a, a, a lot of the draw has fallen apart. Ostapenko was the surprise loss against Kerber. Um, you know, Ostapenko is another player that we've been kind of hot on since the start of this year and having good runs. But I think, again, one forgets hardcore, but totally different conditions than what an Ostapenko would typically like. Uh, Kerber of old would love these conditions. Um, slow ability for her to be defensive. Get, get into rallies and kind of challenge those power hitters. So surprised based on run of form, but based off of the, the game styles, not as big of a surprise. Then we've got Wozniacki, who's back in the mix, had a couple of good wins, obviously got a wild card into the tournament. That'll be an exciting matchup between those two yeah. Grand Slam champs and, and old dogs, really, which is pretty funny. I think um, also some some you know shout outs again for the American players. Obviously, Peyton Stones had a good run. Also, Caroline Dollahide had some good performances. And then still in the mix, as you mentioned, Emma Navarro beating um, Svitolina last night in three sets. Navarro playing some big ball this week. She's got um, she's got a knack about her tennis that I find very intriguing. I find her trajectory and rise up the rankings very interesting. Another player that's come through college ball and is starting to kind of figure out life on tour a little bit now um, and is is grinding through some of these matches and kind of, yeah, seems to be willing to go the go the hard yards and um, and get get a big win. So um, Svitolina has been someone that I think, again, we've been hot on that we've thought could be dangerous this year. So huge win for Navarro. And then lastly, to throw in the mix, like, is Maria Sakari back? She scooped up. Uh, Jessica Pagula's old coach and um, since they parted ways earlier this year she switched back from the Wilson shift to the ultra um, so change it change that back and has had a couple of good wins here in New Wales like is she gonna get that like new coach resurgence or any thoughts on any of those names I've mentioned yeah, well, Sakari, I'm I'm hoping that these kind of couple wins get her the confidence because I always root for Sakari. Uh, yeah. That being said, I didn't think Garcia versus Sakari was that pretty of a match, to be completely honest. No. Um, uh, both both <laughs> players not playing. I mean, both they both went six for six on breakpoints converted, but largely that was to do with the servers. 
Um, Garcia, I have a stat. Garcia, 48% of her first serves in and went just eight out of 24 on second serve. That's one out, uh, That's one in every three. And that's the majority of the service points that she was playing. So Garcia has yeah. been struggling as well recently. What I hope for is that this will give her confidence, like I said, for uh, future wins. And like you said, the new coach, that's interesting. Um, Paris has actually been playing pretty well this season. Uh, yeah. Beat Travison Fernandez, then Blinkova, who beat Pagula. Uh, so we'll see. I actually think that's going to be a very, very good fourth round match between Pari and Sakari. And, uh, I just hope like Guadalajara that gave Sakari a little bit of confidence last year. It didn't seem to pan out for anything that big afterwards, but, uh, hopefully a, a decent run here to the quarters or semis, albeit with a good draw, hopefully can give her a, uh, some confidence for the, for the season ahead. Um, that's yeah. what I would say about that. And the other name I would say is Marta Kuschuk because she didn't have a bad year. Yes. So she made the quarters there. She made the finals in San Diego. Um, lost to a very in-form Casey Bolter, who hits a big ball. Um, she's competed well here again. I think she's currently playing against Pavla Chankova, so it could be old news by the time I toot her horn and if she loses. But um, I, I do think she has been showing some development in her game. She's still a little bit of a tough watch, to be honest. It's like... Uh, it's just she looks so angry all the time and, and looks like she's hating life but I mean she's a fighter, she's a competitor that that you know you're going to get from her and sometimes it teeters over the limit but I think she's someone that's finding those boundaries and has been having a good a good year so far and um, I, have a, I have a keen eye on to cause some trouble this week Yeah, I thought Kostya looked great very intense, very um, I don't know, very confident and I thought it looked great Coco Goff, by the way, the great win over Clara Burrell. Uh, Burrell played fantastic as well, to be honest. But Goff was down, I think it was uh, 2 5, left 15, down 4 0, double break in the third set, still managed to wait mm. right back. And somehow you never really questioned Coco. Um, but, you know, <laughs> hopefully she gets the comeback. confidence. That's a crazy comeback, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of also, Kostyuk won her match against Pavlyuchenkova. So oh, there you go. So, you're, uh, well, you said it's not soiled. You can uh, keep that in. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Goff has not lost a match in America since uh, Cincinnati, I believe. Cincinnati, Washington, U.S. Open. Now she's here in IW. So that's going to be yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. I mean, such impressive fight because she was not playing good tennis. And um, we saw it in the AO and we're seeing it again here. She has this ability to just stay calm and stick with it and try to, you know, fight her way through a match. And I mean, Burrell will be kicking herself because she had every opportunity to finish her off and, and couldn't and Coco again is just showing that um that that's what separates a top you know top five grand slam champion level player from you know a woman who's knocking on the door of the top 20 um in their ability to, to hang in a match and you know let their opponent kind of beat themselves at the end of the day which is what she did all right and now for the power ranking section of the podcast um so all right here we go power rankings uh <laughs> Sinner and Shriantek. Um, Shriantek moved up for me. Uh, it should be plus one. Shriantek moved up for me from the uh, number two slot to the number one because I said losing seven games to Noskova and uh, uh, to Noskova and Collins is pretty good. Um, you know, struggle with both of them at the Australians. Pretty good to fight back um, against two aggressive players. I think she loves these conditions. Sabalenka is also playing great, so we'll just see how the event pans out. Um, Goff moves up. Uh, I, I, I like her moving up, you know, I had a lot of the people perform well in Dubai in these power rankings. Um, and, uh, I, I just like how Coco's looking. I think she'll get confidence from that Burrell win. Um, then moving down the WTA rankings, I've got Paolini, then I've got Kostyuk. I also agree. She looked very good. Uh, Rabakna is down to number six. If she can play, she's fantastic. I think, uh, Kazakina, uh, always like how she looks. Uh, she's in the fourth round and she's been playing great. She fights very, very well. And uh, it's not always pretty, but you know she's just such a <laughs> such a top tier of player, and she she can figure out a way. And then I've also got Emma Navarro, who I think's looked fantastic. I agree a lot that uh, U.S. women have been doing great. Pavlu Chinkova, who's still killing it, uh, been around it seems like forever. And then I've got Claire Burrell. I wanted to shout out Burrell because she played fantastic versus Goff and could have could have won that match. Um, yeah. So those are my top ten. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we, we didn't chat last week after the San Diego Open, so there yeah. may have been some some changes that, you know, aren't reflected here. But, I mean, I, I pretty much started with a clean slate from Goff 
downwards, as you can see from all the plus signs. Um, Paulini, I knocked off, even though she had a good run um, winning her first, um, was it Masters title or is it a 500 title? Masters title. Masters title. Um, yeah, in the Middle East. Um, but she she lost earlier this in the previous round. So um, I'm just giving a nod to everybody who's still <laughs> in the main draw pretty much at this Indian Wells tournament given that we will update the power rankings again next week, I'll sort of reflect overall season performances and how things are looking. But based on on who's still here, I think, um, you know, Kazakina for me is in the number four spot because I think these conditions are fantastic for her. And I think she has a decent draw. Uh, again, similar thoughts on Kustuk. I think Kaba again, likes these conditions. I, I like a defensive player that can just turn D into O in, you know, uh, in an efficient way, Wozniacki is the same type of player. So obviously one of these guys will take the other out and I'm really not sure who's going to do it. Maybe give slight edge to Wozniacki because she's been around, uh, been back on tour just that little bit longer than Kaba. Um, but popcorn match for me. Um, Navarro, as I mentioned, great form, come through some tough matches. Sakari, uh, wondering if she is gonna gonna find some good energy here and then diane perry i mean she's also battled through a couple of good matches at this tournament i think she's looking efficient and um has some you know good good weapons on her side so wouldn't be surprised if she kind of finds herself deep in the tournament this week yeah uh kerber was nyaki i i don't know when's the I, i'm sure they have had said that range is back like a decade back I yeah exactly i was gonna say that. i feel like i i talked about them in french class when i was like 30 years old <laughs> 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 looking at the like, matches yeah um, it was funny i actually told my boss i was like was nyaki's playing today and he was like what yeah. she's still playing and i was like yeah <laughs> she's back <laughs> she's back she's back on tour yeah. yeah. Well, I know it was crazy when people were saying like Ivanovich is coming back. I was like, who next is that? Like no. a Steffi Graf coming back next. I was like, God, just, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyway, that'll be fun. ATP, uh, ATP side, uh, just to kind of round off here as well. Yeah. Um, got Sinner, then got Medvedev. I've got Demonor at third because Demon's been playing amazing. Why not give him a top three spot? Uh, Zverev, oh, I got Demonor at fifth. That's, that's my mistake. Let me see who else. Oh, Alcaraz. That's what I meant to put in here. Alcaraz. Alcaraz has been playing well last couple of matches against. We didn't talk much about Alcaraz, but uh, he had good wins against Arnaldi and FAA. Uh, yep. Four good consecutive sets. And, um, you know, he's been doing well. Fritz, I added in here. Uh, uh, Fritz is in the mix. Uh, loves playing at Indian Wells. I'm just really confident about him this week, and the draws opened up so well. And uh, then Djokovic, and then Dimitrov, Lahechka, and Rude. Dimitrov, Lahechka, and Rude. Dimitrov's not new to the power rankings, but uh, he's he's back in here as he should be. He's a top 10 guy at the moment. And I do like him in the, these conditions. Lahechka and Rude, um, Lahechka's playing so crazy. And we'll see if he keeps that up. And Casper, I said, if he has another decent run, he'll get in here. He's won a couple matches. He gets into the the 10 spot um if you want to go over your top 10 for the men's yeah i well, feel bad for not including dimitrov he probably should be in here but i mean geez it's tough the, the men are playing well there are some good good uh good good choices to make um sin is obviously my top spot medvedev follows i think alcaraz is sitting pretty in number three fancy him to to find some form here i do think Zverev is continues to be dangerous as he has been all season um taylor fritz i moved back into my power rankings for some reason he fell out of mine um when we last did our podcast but uh yeah, yeah i, I yeah. think he's certainly kind of amongst the names here to to reach a final or to win it um Dimonor, similar similar feelings about i think that's going to be a really interesting match between zwerev and Dimonor. um so i'm excited for that one Kasparud, I'm sort of wondering if these conditions are favorable for him i i feel like he should beat Monfils. Um, I think he might be a party pooper as much as I don't want him to be. I, I think he will win that match. I agree with you that uh, Tommy Paul is a sleeper in this draw. Um, and I think that he has a undercurrent to him that's like, I want to be the American that, you know, is, is in conversation here and maybe thrives off of the fact that the attention is a little bit more pointed towards Taylor Fritz. And He's been quietly getting his business done and, and looking good. So um wouldn't be surprised if if he makes a deep run. 
Bruna obviously, uh, I think, kind of cheats his way into the third round. So maybe if I were to redo this, I'd swap it with Dimitrov. Um, I'm not sure on his form at the moment, but, um, you know, uh, he has the game to play well. It's whether he he turns up this week or not. So, yeah, if I were to redo it, I'd swap that out. And then Shelton, I know that it, Shelton constantly comes in and out of my power rankings. I love the kid. I love the energy. I think he loves the American crowd. I think he's going to pump himself up tonight against Sinner and I think he's shown again that he's a top 20 player and he's going to stay here for the time being so um some good performances to beat Sarandolo the other night um had certainly did so efficiently so and came through a tough second round match I forget against who but um problem solved well and yeah. came back uh, yeah. was he was, a it was a bit of a tough watch against. It was a tough, bit of a tough watch against Sorrentino, though. That was. It was not. It was not a perfect match. It was like he had like twenty winners and like over double the unforced from both players. It was not easy. But then Shelton backed it up with the third round. So we'll see how Shelton continues if he can improve his form. Um, and then uh, Demonor versus Verov is interesting because Verov is a top by a top six guy in good form, but I think Demonor is the favorite. I, I yeah. kind of think that Demonor might be the favorite just because of how well he's played recently coming off the Acapulco title, um, mm -hmm. which uh, uh, is very lost in the semis there. So uh, I kind of think Demonor is a big favorite there. And, um, Who did Zverev lose to in the semis? Was it Thompson? Jordan Thompson. Thompson yeah. yeah, okay. So bizarre. Yeah. yeah. And then Thompson loses to Shung 6 3 6 3 here. But uh, tennis, you know. Um, tennis. Tennis. <laughs> uh, and then Casper uh, Rude and Monfils, like you said, yeah. I. Uh, I think that that's going to be a great match. I think with Monfils, it is fully and utterly unpredictable. I think our jobs are soiled with uh, calling what's going to happen that match. I think we just got to watch and enjoy it. I don't think we can, yeah. we can predict it at all. Um, I, agree. I, do, I do like Rude in these conditions, but Monfils is just playing so crazy that I, I really want him to go on a run. We'll see if that uh, is something that is viable or can happen. But all right, guys. Uh, I think that's going to call for this podcast. Uh, we're going to be back to talk next week, uh, talk about all the champions and all the results for next week. Appreciate everybody joining in. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to like all that stuff. I've been Anthony Hirsch. I'm Eliza Westgate. Appreciate you guys joining in. See you guys at the next one.